Thank you so much for, for having me here. And, and I've, I've just had a immensely enjoyable time today. Did my mic just come on? Perfect. Uh, these have been great talks. I think this has been a terrific venue to get together both practitioners and researchers and everyone on to kind of get on the same page. And, and, and what I'll be talking about today is homelessness. We're not going to end on the most uh, uplifting of topics. We're going to end on a big societal problem. Um, and the, the session is called Causes and Consequences of Homelessness. I'm going to concentrate especially on kind of how we've been learning about these causes and cause consequences and the immense opportunities that we have to move forward. Is my mic cutting in or out, or is that just the way I see it? Okay, perfect, perfect. Um, and so I come from a research background. I'm an economist, so in particular, uh, that's what I'll speak to. And I'm really, I feel very privileged to share the stage with, with Jeff Kosicki, who will, will then talk to you about how this plays out on the ground in one of the most kind of interesting regions, I think, in the country, as we all, all know in San Francisco. Um, I'll start with a very, I'm learning how to use Keynote to make my presentations more accessible. So I'm trying to have like a really Steve Jobs clean slide. What is, so what is homelessness here? I, the reason I wanted to just start very, very broad, because we've been kind of very much in the nitty gritty of San Francisco uh, housing here. Let me just frame this in a particular way. I often get asked the question like, oh, Igor, you're writing papers on the homeless. You're, you're studying the homeless. You know, and I want to kind of frame the question a little differently in that homelessness fundamentally is a state. It is a state of the world or a situation. It's, it's, some, it's, it's not an identity or a demographic per se. The population of who is and who is not homeless is changing constantly more so maybe than, than casual observers might even expect. So once we start talking about homelessness as a state, we can ask questions about how many people are entering the state. Can we insure against the state? And, and, and questions like this. And I think these are very important questions. So homelessness in America is, uh, is far from a small or a simple or a painless or a solved problem. Homelessness is extremely pervasive. So uh, when I'm talking about homelessness here, I mean, you know, essentially the, ad, the, the, the state of not being able to, to, to support independent housing such that you're required to either live in a space not meant for human habitation or rely on a homeless program for shelter. So how many people uh, rely on such homeless programs each, each year? It's about 1.5 million. So on any given night, there are about 600,000 people who are unsheltered. They're, oh, sorry, there are about 600,000 people who are homeless on any given night. About a third of those are unsheltered, meaning they're sleeping in their, in their cars, on sidewalks, and so forth. Just a very, very rough kind of order of magnitude. About 1% of the U.S. population can expect to experience a spell of homelessness in the next five years. This is a huge, huge problem. And in some sense, you know, even if these numbers were tiny, you know, I still think this would be worth studying and worth thinking about because these are really some of the most impoverished and vulnerable people in our society. Moreover, the policies that address homelessness are still often widely debated. Um, you might have certain community fights play out where people say, well, of course there are people sleeping on the streets. We're not spending any money on them. You have other people that say, well, there are people that are sleeping out on the streets because we have this net of services. In fact, if you make it more generous, people will come from the next town over and, and use those services so you're not actually addressing the fundamental issue. So these kind of like economic pulls and pushes, I think, are, are, are fascinating and really worth exploring. And we've, economists have done so across a wide variety of topics. So when I was an early graduate student, I was, you know, I would get into JSTOR and econpapers.net and I would look at, all right, what kind of, uh, I'm really interested in, you know, incentive effects versus trying to do good through anti-poverty programs. Found thousands and thousands of papers on, on trying to insure against health shocks, trying to insure against employment shocks. And I thought, oh, but I, but I want to know something about homelessness. Turns out economics is really far behind in addressing this issue relative to uh, So I guess there are two ways to look at this graph. One is you should study social security and the other is you should study homelessness. Uh, <laughs> I suppose I've done a little bit of both, but I think, I think there's, there's really a lot to be done. Why is it that there's such a dearth of, of literature? Why aren't, why aren't you, why, why isn't there a class on, on, on homelessness and the economics of homelessness at Stanford? You know, I think there are kind of like two reasons why the literature has not delved into, despite broad interest from economists, in public economics and these, these balances of incentive effects. Uh, people are concerned about and, and the ways that public policies play out um, uh, in, our, in our models and in, in the empirics. I think there's two related issues. One is there's a common set of misconceptions to where you start kind of getting into this. You realize that the casual kind of educated person and the people that actually know a lot about homelessness have widely different views on what, uh, on, on, on what homelessness even is uh, and, and the kind of policies that may address it. So, you know, again, once you start kind of getting in, you'll hear a lot of people who you know, might not have much experience with homelessness, but uh, are kind of, you know, just educated readers of common um, press and so forth, 
making various statements such as the ones that are up here that are all kind of wrong to various degrees. Um, and I think part of the reason has been until recently a real lack of data. I mean, again, these are some of the hardest people to gather data on, right? They're, they're almost by definition. We've been studying poverty by sending people surveys at their house and waiting for them to send them back. This is a very hard population to study. So you'll hear, hear people say things like, oh, it's all because of deinstitutionalization. You know, so when in the 1980s, especially when homelessness kind of became the modern epidemic that it is now, people thought, oh, well, of course, well, recently we got rid of all these state-run mental health facilities. Oh, and now they're all homeless. So, you know, certainly mental health is a very large challenge in, in, uh, across uh, communities that fight homelessness. But just think about it. actually one out of every five uh, people at a time who are homeless are children. 40% of the homeless population is comprised of families. You know, this is a much, much wider problem than the problem that one imagines when they kind of close their eyes and think of a homeless person. A very particular image comes into mind that's really only part of the whole uh, spectrum of issues that, that homelessness and homeless pro program providers have to deal with on a daily basis. Um, people say, oh, well, it's just because they don't want to work. Well, that's actually, now that we have data, we know that's fundamentally not true. Uh, an often cited Urban Institute study found that 45% of, of, of uh, homeless individuals that were, that were polled had employment in the, last 40, uh, in the last 30 days. And some data from Santa Clara County that I, that I, that I examined, 41% of families who were checking into homeless shelters in Santa Clara County were employed at the time they were checking in, 22% of individuals. Um, we're just encouraged, encouraging the homeless to move here. There are all these issues about, basically every city in America thinks that they're at risk of becoming a homeless magnet. This is something that, that uh, is very interesting to try to tease out in a peer review test. I'm happy to kind of talk about that here. But again, there are misconceptions surrounding that. Um, another interesting one is, is, is the sense of homelessness, uh, uh, homeless programs needing to make people housing ready. I think this is a, a, something that's been kind of an interesting trend as to, with housing first model that, that, that you might hear a lot about in policy discussions about homelessness, the community has now thought, all right, well, let's not try to get people housing ready. Let's just give them housing. And oh my goodness, it's going to be so much easier for people to work through whatever issues are precipitating their homelessness once you have an address and once you have a place uh, to call home. Anyways, the, that's kind of a, a, you know, painting this mismatch between, I guess, public perception and, and reality. But now it's, what I actually want to stress, and I realize that there are, you know, given the amount of students in the room, that there's actually now a lot of data that's becoming available that we can use to study homelessness in a more, more rigorous and interesting way. Um, let me just say, like, you know, because I'm a data nerd, a few things about the data that's becoming available. Um, every program that now receives some form of federal funding in the United States, which is the vast majority of programs, has to maintain records on everyone who checks in and they're asked a, uh, an intake survey that, that is actually incredibly detailed. So communities now have information on who is checking in, how often they're checking in, how often they're staying, what their income sources are. Did you become, uh, where was your last prior residence? What zip code was that in? There's an incredible wealth of information that communities are now sitting on and the quality is getting better and better every day. Moreover, um, uh, there are these new point in time counts that give us a, pers uh, a whole perspective on the entire homeless population uh, in the United States. So I don't know if some people have participated in these, but, but communities are now required to, and again, in exchange for federal funding, required to go out and basically do a massive survey of the entire homeless population. Uh, so this occurs in, 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 a, in the last week of January. Every other year, many communities are doing it every year. So the communities will now hire an army of volunteers, and they'll go out and they'll count not only the people that are in their homeless programs, but people that are actually out on the street so we get a sense of the entire problem. Now, with that, we can actually start kind of getting to the facts. So this is data from, from 2011, but these, these numbers haven't changed too much since. Uh, I know there are a lot of numbers here, but let me just focus on, on, um, on a couple. Uh, the first point that I want to make is that, again, many, many people have this kind of image of what it means to be a homeless person. Imagine someone who's probably about 50 years old. Imagine that it's a man. It's a he. He has a beard, he looks like he's been sleeping out on the street for a while. That's kind of this image of like the, the archetypal homeless person. So how many people, if you take the whole homeless population at a point in time, how many of those people are actually unsheltered sleeping out on the street and qualify as being chronically homeless? Well, it turns out only about 13%, right? So this is just the tip of the iceberg of a much, much wider problem. 
So number two, who, who else is kind of comprising this, this, uh, this population of those who are not necessarily entering our minds when we think about homelessness, but are utilizing these resources and benefiting from them? Many, many, many families. So again, this is why there are a lot of children that experience homelessness. We have about 40% of people at a point in time who are experiencing homelessness are actually part of families, all right? Um, families and individuals tend to have very different characteristics as well. So there are various programs that, that are targeted towards each, but in particular, kind of uh, families are far less likely to be unsheltered. They're less likely to be actually sleeping out on the street or in their cars. They're less likely to be chronically homeless, less likely to have veteran status. Um, this data, along with recent interest in, in, in communities to experiment with new types of homeless programs, you know, let's, how can we move from just putting up a series of shelters and, and to, to new, more innovative programs? This has led to a really, I, I think, a really exciting burst of research that's been happening in the world of homelessness and homeless programs. So um, uh, earlier, uh, th th this, this idea was brought up that one of the most surprising findings that's, you know, been replicated in, in a variety of communities was actually giving apartments for free to the chronically homeless will save you money. Even if you imagine your uncle who hates the homeless, it will still be good for him to give them apartments. Why? Because you have to think about the counterfactual. Um, you have to think about the counterfactual where if those who are chronically homeless are utilizing an emergency room for shelter five nights a week, the, I'm sorry, or five, even five nights a month, there's literally no more expensive way to live in the United States. But that's for, I guess that's for the health economy. So I'll figure out why that is. Uh, so Mark's working on it. Um, I've been doing a lot of research examining what federal funding actually does to outcomes. So what would happen if we expand federal funding for homeless programs? Uh, uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development kind of helps me out with this because they distribute funding in a lot of crazy ways, which means that you can find similar communities that give very different funding allocations. So I use this to tease apart essentially the effects of what happens when we spend more money on homeless programs. I find that actually a lot of good happens when we spend more money on homeless programs. Uh, one, we actually get people off the streets. So it's not that, okay, some people just will never enter shelters, they don't prefer it. No, when funding comes in, when the space becomes available, unsheltered rates of homelessness do go down. Do you see more homeless families in regions where they get more disproportionately generous funding? I find yes, but there's a, there's a big twist. So across chronically homeless people, the answer is no. Do you find more chronically homeless people in areas that receive more funding? Is there some sort of dependence effect or negative incentive effects that, that the data can pick up? Or the answer is absolutely not. Do I see migration across regions and responses to funding when I, when I do this analysis? Yes, but again, it's not what you would expect. It's actually families that are moving nearby to nearby communities in order to find housing. Because for them, it's extremely costly to be unsheltered. Um, now, there's also been a, a, a large number of, of, of recent studies that I'm really excited about. Thinking not just about, okay, what if we, you know, my work in some sense is, all right, what if we expand or contract the status quo? There are a lot of new innovative solutions that are being evaluated uh, uh, as well that I think are really exciting that, that explore various forms of voucher programs set aside for, for homelessness, various prevention efforts, uh, coordination across, across regions. Um, as well as, I think it's important to think in mind, I think this is a very promising avenue for future research. You know, homelessness doesn't exist in a vacuum. Homelessness is actually kind of the last layer of what's actually a quite broad and interesting social safety net. So it's very much worth asking, why are these people arriving at this place in the first place? If there was something upstream would catch them in the net before they got to, to a state where they needed to rely on a homeless shelter, um, would that be better? Presumably, but we need to figure out how that, how that actually works in practice. Um, but we still have a long way to go. Um, I think that, that uh, the, the recent research efforts have, have been both, both illuminating, I think they've been valuable, but I think especially for the students, this is a very uh, area that's, that's ripe for research for these new data sources. Uh, and I'm very much excited about it. So thank you so much. Uh, that I'll pass it on to to Jeff. Later. Thank you all very much. Whoa, that's like a double. Turn that that way. Is this working okay? All right. Thank you all very much for enduring one more PowerPoint presentation. Um, Three thirty on a Friday. Um, 
I work for uh, Mayor Lee, running the Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing, a new department that was set up to bring together all homeless programs in San Francisco under, under one roof. I um, want to talk to you a little bit today about uh, homelessness in San Francisco. Um, how did we get here? Where we're going? Um, first of all, I want to talk about the fact that we're not going to solve homelessness at the local level. We're not going to solve it um, with a little bit more money from HUD or through innovative programs. There are major systemic problems in the United States that until we address those problems, we're not going to truly solve homelessness. Um, one of the problems um, you know, is financial related. It's the fact that the HUD budget today is about 20% of what it was in 1978. Um, and this isn't a great picture of this graph, but I love the artwork. It shows the reduction of the HUD budget and the rise uh, in homelessness in the US. Um, a couple important things to note. Uh, one is that housing discrimination was perfectly legal until the Fair Housing Act of 1968. And as Kim Mike pointed out, there's many ways that it, it continues to this day. Uh, that is one of the reasons why we see such a great a disparity in terms of uh, people of color in the United States and the percentage of people of color who are, who are homeless. I um, should point out that the HUD budget uh, is only uh, $50 billion, but the mortgage interest tax deduction is nearly $70 billion. The largest housing subsidy program in the United States subsidizes uh, the housing for middle and upper income individuals. And Zillow came out with an interesting uh, study a couple of years ago saying that if the mortgage interest tax uh, uh, deduction was completely eliminated, it would really have no negative impact on, on the housing market. Um, I think it's also very telling that the IRS runs the largest affordable housing program in the United States, uh, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. Uh, and I think that just tells us something about where our priorities are um, as a country. I think there's other sort of systemic issues that I don't know how we get to. You know, the U.S. economy favors home ownership and the appreciation of property. Um, you know, we want our, pro our property values to go up. That's sort of how we get to this American dream. And we favor that over the idea of rental housing and uh, affordability. You'll see other countries, even Germany, which has a much, uh, the tax system's more biased towards uh, rental housing, and they don't have a lot of the housing problems that we have in the U.S. Um, state policies also um, contribute to uh, where we're at uh, in the United States, uh, especially in California, around homelessness. As you'll see, sorry, it's a terrible screenshot. I couldn't actually get the, um, the report to become a PowerPoint slide. But um, California is number 48th out of 50th uh, in, in ranking in terms of spending on family homelessness, for example. Um, and this is a, we're looking at a whole variety of, of metrics here, but uh, not just funding, but we're ranked 48th out of 50. I think two southern states are, are below us. Uh, I could also, you know, I'll go through this really quickly because uh, Kim Mai and others already spoke about this. In California, the ending of the redevelopment agencies, um, inconsistent funding for affordable housing, uh, Costa Hawkins and Ellis Act uh, limit our ability to regulate the rental market and Prop 13 and other laws uh, really make it difficult to raise local revenue. Um, all of these have uh, greatly affected homelessness um, and housing instability here in uh, California, especially in the Bay Area. Uh, there's some other factors, but these are not the causes. Really, this is about housing policy. Um, homelessness is directly related to housing policy. Of course, reduction in funding for mental health services, um, a, a growing, you know, dramatically growing heroin epidemic um, in the United States and a pretty anemic recovery for poor people uh, after the Great Recession uh, has impacted homelessness and exacerbated it, but it is really all, all about housing. So the federal and state uh, policies um, and spending priorities have caused this problem. Local governments um, are left to pick up the pieces, and uh, unfortunately that falls on people like me uh, who are trying to, in a face of, of you know, all these challenges um, that come down to us from the federal and state level, how do we deal with the fact uh, that there is so much homelessness on our streets? What can we do locally? Um, a couple things about uh, homelessness in San Francisco. I should point out all the things that Igor was talking about, you know, all these new ideas around housing first, around prevention, um, around new kinds of programs. Most of that stuff was actually uh, pioneered in San Francisco. We started doing, everybody's talking about housing first and Salt Lake City and uh, rapid rehousing in Houston. All that stuff was started in San Francisco in, in 1989. 
um, by two organizations, one called the Community Housing Partnership and the other called Hamilton Family Center. By coincidence, I happen to have worked for both of those organizations, but that was long before they, long after they sort of pioneered, um, pioneered these models. We've helped 23,000 people since 2004 end their homelessness in San Francisco. So despite what people will tell you, we've done a pretty remarkable job um, on this issue in the city. Um, approximately 770 of every 100,000 San Franciscans is, is um, homeless. That's an increase of about 3% over the past two years. But if you compare us to most other major cities in the United States, uh, we're doing great. Most other major cities have had uh, double-digit increases. LA, New York, Denver, um, Honolulu, um, Seattle, Portland, all have had double-digit increases. And we've managed to, um, to really hold the line. Um, not that I want to celebrate not getting too much worse, but it's, it's notable that some of the policies that uh, Igor spoke about actually have been very effective in San Francisco. So right now we have 6,700 single adults experiencing homelessness on any given night in San Francisco. 4,000 of them are unsheltered. Um, uh, one in every 25 public school students um, are homeless. That's one in every 25 kids. That's enough to fill 70 cl classrooms. Um, I, I respectfully disagree with the number that there's only 1.5 million homeless people in the United States because the U.S. Department of Education has reported that there's 1.2 million children alone. The point in time count and the way that HUD collects data on homelessness does not really capture, uh, in my opinion, uh, how, how terrible the problem is, especially for families. Um, so one in every 25, it's just, uh, it's really unbelievable. Uh, in the, you know, one of the richest cities in the world, that that's, that's where our school system is at. And my wife is a public school teacher, and I can tell you that this affects all the students in the school, not just the kids who are homeless. Um, it's also important to note that even though our point in time count, which HUD requires us to do, says there's 6,700 homeless adults on any given night, there's at least 10,000 people. I mean, it's, and I think we think it's closer to 14,000 in, individuals accessing services in San Francisco uh, every year who are homeless. Um, there's been a significant increase in street homelessness in San Francisco due to a variety of reasons, mainly all the real estate development in areas where homeless people used to be hunkered down. Um, so now we're seeing them kind of out in the neighborhoods uh, in the central part of the city. And there's also, that's where most of our social services are, are available. And that's by design. They, they wanted to create a containment zone in the city um, where all the poor people were going to be. And that's where all the services are located. And this has led to some pretty serious quality um, of life issues in the city. So a couple other important factors that I'm having to deal with. One is the fact that we have only 1,400 shelter beds and 900 people on the waiting list. And as I said before, but there's 4,000 unsheltered people in the city. Um, and we have the highest number of supportive housing units per capita, this housing first model that everybody is saying is the answer to homelessness. We have more per capita than any other city in the country. Um, but only 500 of those units become available every year due because we're very good at running them. People don't get evicted. Once they get housed, they stay there. We're a great example of how Housing First can work. Um, but at the same time, we shifted a lot of our money from shelters and from resource centers into supportive housing. We've closed about 1,200 shelter beds in the past 10 years and closed three resource centers, uh, which is another reason why we're seeing so many people um, out on the streets. You know, but at the end of the day, this is a lot of water trying to get through um, a very small pipe, and this is what has happened um, on the streets of San Francisco. There has just been an explosion of um, street homelessness, tent encamp encampments that are very dangerous. They're really like post-apocalyptic. Um, I'm out in them almost every other day. Um, four out of five women in the encampments have been raped. There's been 120 fires um, in just so far this year in tent encampments in San Francisco, and the rate of crime is, you know, pretty much everybody has been a, a victim. Um, so that's all the bad news. Um, some of the good news, I'm going to skip over some of this stuff. So the, <laughs> let's get right to the, the, the really good news. So the mayor created this, because he keeps holding up signs, and there's one with a skull and crossbones. I don't want to get to that. Um, so you know, the mayor created this new department, bringing together five different um, uh, money, people, or programs from five different departments under one roof. Um, sort of got rid of this policy advisor office and, and put everything under one department that I'm uh, responsible for running right now. And there's some things that I think that we can do to make a real difference in the lives of people who are homeless and, and to, to get more people off of our streets, despite the fact that we're, we're it's really like pushing a, you know, a threat uphill given the federal and state policies we're up against. Um, one thing is to use data. 
So we're in the process of using, doing a gaps analysis and trying to figure out how many shelter beds would we need, how many housing units would we need for different subpopulations, for youth, for vets, for chronically homeless, episodically homeless, seniors, families. Um, would we need to actually have an, a significant impact on the number of people who are homeless? And how do we get throughput in the system? How do we get some of the people that are in those 6,700 units of housing to move out um, using uh, public housing authority vouchers or, or other ways so that we can make room for more folks? Um, we're developing, right now we have 13 different databases that uh, manage homeless programs in San Francisco. Uh, we're gonna consolidate them into one. It's actually called the One System. It's online navigation and entry system. And what that's gonna do is if you're homeless right now, you kind of wander around San Francisco until you get into the right line, and it may not even be the right line. You get assessed 15 times by 15 different 23-year-old social workers right out of school who are well-intentioned, but you know, it's really demoralizing as, a, as an adult. You know, it's a 50-year-old adult, uh, and to have to retell your story of your supposed failures over and over and over again, it's really inhumane, and this is gonna eliminate that. There'll be one assessment. Uh, you'll get it done once. Everybody who works in the system will have access to it, and then we'll be able to really air traffic control folks through the system, and at the very least, make sure those 500 units of housing that become available and those 1,400 shelter beds are being used for the sickest and longest-term homeless, which you know is not going to end the problem, but I think what it's going to do um, is to at least make sure that our public resources are being used for those who need it the most. Um, and, and it may also, I will eliminate waiting lists. We will have no more waiting lists in San Francisco because waiting lists make people wait. So um, there are people in the city who can resolve their homelessness on their own, but we create a system right now where they just wait in line till maybe they get something. And, and I think that's gonna make a big difference. We're trying to expand housing exits. I don't have time to talk about how we're doing that in an expensive real estate market. Doing some more investment in prevention um, like we evict people out of housing and then who are mentally ill, who we know are gonna become homeless and we don't we just let that happen. So I think that's gonna be an easy one to fix. And we're spending a lot of time trying to figure out how to address encampments and street homelessness, but again, I don't have a whole lot of time. Um, so, um, and I think, you know, and we've set some pretty, pretty significant goals for ourselves, which I think, you know, will at least give us something to aspire towards and to make a difference. We think we can end veterans homelessness by 2018. We have 700 more vets to house to achieve that goal. Um, we're gonna try to reduce the unsheltered population by 50% and family homelessness by, the, by 2020. And we've got data and um, I think pretty robust plans that can potentially make this all happen. But you know, moving forward, I think it's important to remember homelessness was created by design. Um, it really was, it's by the design of our housing policies at the state and local level. The good news is that anything that was designed can be redesigned. So we can change these things, but we're gonna have to change them, um, not only to address issues like homelessness and gentrification, I mean, but I think in our education system and just preserving a middle class in the US, we have to redesign how we deal um, with housing in the United States. It should be seen as a human right and federal policy and spending should really reflect that. California needs to increase spending on homelessness or at the very least eliminate policies that restrict local action like Costa Hawkins, Ellis Act, Prop 13. Those all restrict local action um, and those things need to change. Um, local governments need to stop trying to criminalize homelessness um, but really focus on, um, still focus on street homelessness and supportive housing but trying to criminalize and pass laws that you know, make it illegal to be um, don't help uh, the matter. And I think businesses and individuals and NGOs and students and all of us should be getting involved um, in these issues. So how can you help? Um, I, I would like all of us to become, to become radicals and practice three tenets of radicalism. One is, is radical common sense. Um, you know, we have to stop listening to the voices on either side of this issue, you know, and sweep the bums off the street or let's set up tent encampments and let everybody live in, in campgrounds all over, all over our cities. We know a lot of the research has been done. Like we know what some of the solutions are. We should force our politicians and our bureaucrats like myself to just be commonsensical in how we approach the problem and not keep, you know, every time something new and fancy comes up to go chasing after that brass ring. Uh, we know what's gonna work. We should stay focused on that. You know, I ask all of you to be radically generous with your time, uh, with your talents, uh, with your treasure. Uh, donate, get involved in local nonprofit organizations that are working on these issues. There's great ones all over the Bay Area. You know, please you know, get involved, even if it's as a one-off event. 
Lastly, um, and I should go back to the radical common sense. I'm sure some of you students are going to go out and be you know, leaders in, in government and leading thinkers around, around public policy. So please remember what you learned here today and, and use that um, to help, hopefully will help guide you as, you as you do that. But the last thing that I ask you know, all of us to do, um, regardless of whether you're going to become the new head of HUD or donate all your time and money to a nonprofit, is practice radical compassion. So people who are out on the streets are our brothers and sisters. They are somebody's sons. They are somebody's daughters. We have all experienced sort of compassion fatigue in the Bay Area. It's hard to see. It's hard for me to see. Um, but one of the things, just by saying hello to somebody and good morning, and not saying giving them money or even you know, giving them any more than a smile, we, we send out outreach workers into the field every day. And the biggest problem they have um, in getting people to engage in services is just complete lack of trust that folks, that people who are homeless have. They feel hated. Uh, they've lost practice in talking to people. I remember a guy in my neighborhood who I've spoken, who I spoke to, and he broke down crying when I said hello, because he hadn't spoken to another person in three months in a city of you know, almost a million people uh, there during the day. That should not be happening. So please, if, I can, if you take away anything from this, uh, you know, help us who are working in the field, because it may sound hokey um, just to say practice radical compassion and say hi to somebody, but it actually helps our social workers who are out in the field to engage with people. It's just sort of you know, maybe five less encounters that they have to engage in um, if somebody has just feels like they're, they're part of as opposed to you know, reviled by their, by their community. So I thank you all very much for taking the time to, to listen to me and uh, to sit here all day on a Friday and learn about these important issues. So thank you. Thank you, Jeff and Igor. Um, before I open it up to the audience, I just have a couple of questions. So we are at an educational institution. So let's say we're grading California on how it's dealt with the homelessness issue. Um, how would you score California? Jeff, based on your experience of working in San Francisco, and Igor, based on your research, and more importantly, how do we get to an A plus? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think some of my colleagues from the city are here and, and from the state as well. I mean, but it just uh, in the name of sort of radical common sense and transparency, I mean, I would give California and maybe D minus, um, if not an F. I, I would give San Francisco, I, th I think, a B. Um, despite, and I, you know, despite the fact that we're in a state that that deserves a, a D minus. Uh, how do we get to an A plus? I, I think I laid some of that out. I think the state needs to stop restricting local government actions. They need to stop restricting rent control laws. They need to stop taking, they need to, I would say, give back the ability to have redevelopment agencies and do tax increment funding uh, to the state. They need to eliminate our things like Prop 13 that make it very hard to levy property taxes. And there's a whole host of other laws, actually, that make it very hard for local governments to levy any kind of tax. Um, and I think that is a, is a very important uh, part of it. I think the state, along with all of the West Coast states and, and, and the mayors, and actually Mayor Lee is working on this now, needs to get together and go to Washington, D.C. and advocate for some of the other um, policy changes that, that I think we all recognize need to be made at the federal level around, uh, at the very least, around uh, spending and investing in affordable housing. That's right. So I, um, I, I, I agree with everything that's been said. I, I wouldn't, uh, I'm not an expert enough on California in particular to be the, the, the professor that assigns the grade, but I will think there's a lot of extra credit to be had. And the only extra credit that I think I would kind of uh, add to what, to what Jeff said is I think there is a lot that the state could do in terms of coordination. So certain states have have done more than others to kind of get communities talking about. The worst, the worst case scenario is that you have com communities competing against each other to solve their homelessness problems by trying to put it to their neighboring, right? So they, to the extent that there, there are poor local incentives with certain decisions, criminalizing homelessness is one of them where you have various communities in the Bay Area and say, don't sleep with your car here, sleep with your car at the next community over. Um, uh, at, Ideally, you do this without restricting too much control locally, but there, there must be some, some mechanisms to coordinate uh, across communities to where these kind of negative competitive incentives that, that, that uh, communities can have at the local level can be mitigated. Um, and coordinating data. So there's, there's incredible data that's all siloed within each community. Um, and I think there could be great benefits, not just from a research point of view, but from a, from a practical point of view to integrating these data systems, at least within California. Great. Um, and just one more. Uh, a lot of students are going to be, after they graduate college, staying in the Bay Area to work. 
So what advice can you give students in particular um, about how they can help alleviate the pressures of homelessness in their communities? I think, you know, fight the, well, first of all, kind of at, at a very, at a very minimum, I, I, I love what Jeff said about radical compassion, just fight the, the, uh, the desensitization that, that so many, that, that is kind of naturally uh, can, can get ingrained. Stay, stay objective and stay compassionate. Um, and, and, you know, there are, there are a lot of common sense solutions and, and there are a lot of misconceptions that educated people will throw out there. So when you hear them fight, look up the data, look up, look up, look up the facts, and, and even in those conversations, uh, uh, can make a lot of difference. Now, of course, ideally, go further, volunteer, donate your time, donate your energy, but um, uh, at, at the very least, I love point on radical compassion and try to not go through life is that you kind of need to, to get through the day and keep that compassion with its objective analysis. And I would add to what I, I already said in my presentation is to try to think regionally about housing and, and homeless issues. Um, you know, if we look at like New York and even LA, um, you know, all of their homeless funding sort of goes into one big bucket and is spread throughout um, the New York City region or, or, or LA. And, and here we have sort of nine different counties all working independently in a, in a region uh, that really is, is a whole um, to try to push towards those sorts of things. And the other thing I just want to say, uh, you know, as I was driving down here, I was looking around and I haven't been down here for a while. I was like, damn, there's just so much land here, like everywhere. I'm like, where's all this, like, why is this land all empty? Um, so, and that's, you know, so, and that, so I, I think sort of start thinking regionally and, and less about the, your own interests, you know, I understand we don't want, um, you know, Brisbane doesn't want 4,000 units of housing in, in Brisbane. They want San Francisco to build the housing, um, and they want to build a strip mall um, because they don't want more. They like they like the way that it is. But you know that doesn't. At the end of the day, that kind of thinking is going to kill the region. You know, one thing I, I I have the honor really of getting to know a few really interesting folks in the tech community, and one thing that they've pointed out to me is that you know right now the Bay Area is holding on to this like very very valuable commodity, which is this tech industry, we're like the center of the universe um, in, you know, all cool things and that are going to drive economic growth for the next, you know, goodness knows how, how many years. Their employees also can't find places to live uh, who are making, like, more than I am. I just happen to have had my house since 1991, which is the only reason why I can live in San Francisco. But these are folks who are making, you know, $150,000, $200,000 a year. And, and they're talking about, you know, how are we going to keep our companies here? You know, we're at risk of um, not just losing, um, you know, increasing homelessness or, or losing the middle class. We're, we're at risk of losing, um, you know, this important industry if we don't find solutions to this, to this problem. Okay. Audience questions? Thank you very much. I appreciated your comments. I'm Gail Price. I'm a former city council member in Palo Alto. Oh, and I'm on the uh, community working group, which founded the Opportunity Center. So this is a, a plug for the Opportunity Center, which is a permanent supportive housing complex that's been in existence for 10 years. It has housing for individuals and families who were homeless, at risk of homeless, low income, very low income. And there are day services for people who are homeless. So if you want a volunteer opportunity, we have one less than a mile from this room. So it's called the Opportunity Center. And one thing we've also done, it was founded by City of Palo Alto Community Working Group and the Housing Authority in Santa Clara. So this is a plug for partnerships. Uh, also, we've worked with the City of Palo Alto uh, to encourage them to revise their general plan to use permanent supportive housing as a housing option to consider. So I'd recommend that you go back and work with your local officials to put that in the spectrum of housing options because many cities don't really use even the language in the, in the in most important policy document for their cities. And thank you for your work. You're very devoted to the subject matter and to the individuals. Thank you. We have a question up here. Okay. 
thanks so much to both of you for the insights. And Igor, a question for you. The, I thought I saw a recent article, I think in the Wall Street Journal, that said that homeless rates are higher in wealthier states and that there's a correlation between high per capita income and high homelessness by city. And did I misread that? Is it wrong? Or what's the explanation for it if it's right? I, so I didn't see that article, but homelessness is very concentrated still in urban areas. So homelessness is disproportionately an urban problem. And many of those urban centers are reasonably wealthy regions. Um, San Francisco being a great example where I'm sure that data point, you know, alone on, on median income, uh, you know, but still relative to, to more suburban areas uh, uh, will have, will have higher rates of, of homelessness. Um, you know, it's, it's, the, the, the trick is there, there are lots of correlations, and, and the correlations can be spun in many, many different ways. I think the, the, there's a lot of opportunity to be done trying to actually tease apart kind of which, which policies that are, that are new or working, which, which policies that are old need to be rethought. Um, and a lot of that's been done, and like you said, a lot of that we, we kind of know, but, but there's still a lot, a lot to be done. But um, certainly, you know, Almost New York City itself could skew any one of those kinds of regressions. Uh, you know, I think like one in five homeless families live in New York City alone uh, in the U.S. So um, there, there's a lot of a lot of interesting work left to be done there. So I'm curious. So I do a lot of stuff on healthcare, um, and my, so. Uh, Medi-Cal program here in California has expanded a lot over the last couple of years as a result of ACA. I'm curious if um, anyone is looking into um, trying to get a sense of whether that has helped the homeless, that Medi-Cal expansion, and whether we can accumulate that data. And I think there's been work by others, maybe Josh Bamberger or others, about whether doing uh, services for the homeless can um, can significantly reduce their health care costs? Well, I mean, I think there's already a tremendous amount of research that, that shows that that is absolutely the case. You know, in San Francisco, again, the 6,700 6, units we have of permanent supportive housing all has services on site, and, and folks there, you know, dramatically, their health care you know, dramatically improves, you know, in general. Um, there is some potentially good news coming down through ACA. is something called whole person care and health homes, um, which are two Medi-Cal waiver programs which uh, may allow um, us to improve the service provision to, to homeless folks and to add more funding um, you know, into the mix. There's also a state um, measure called uh, uh, No Place Like Home, which is going to redirect some Prop 63 funding towards capital to build more permanent supportive housing. So there is some interesting things coming down through the um, the healthcare world that, that may have a, a positive impact, but um, remains to be seen. And there was a huge burst of homelessness as a result of that. The original homeless folks, many of them were mentally ill, may still be, I don't know. That's a big deal. Yeah, about 35% of the homeless population, at least in San Francisco, have some sort of mental health or substance abuse disorder. Um, it's not as, as high as people believe that it is. Um, but I, I also um, don't think that anybody's looked at whether or not people become mentally ill after they get on the streets or whether they were mentally ill and that's why they end up on the streets. But absolutely need to have better behavioral health services uh, in, in, at least in San Francisco, we're, we're still lacking in that, in that area for sure. Federal stats are some, very similar, around 35. Can we get one more question from an undergrad or Kim? Hi, I'm Andrew. Hi, I'm Andrew. I'm a freshman. I'm from Los Angeles and I haven't seen the literature about Los Angeles in a while, but last time I read about it, something like a third of homelessness is youth homelessness. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk more to the causes and perhaps some solutions of not just uh, family homelessness, but of what I guess you might call unattended minor homelessness as well. You want to go on to Sure. That? Um, so that's a great question. And um, San Francisco does an independent uh, homeless youth count. 
And I think the last time we did it, there were about 900 unaccompanied minors who were homeless in San Francisco, and that's uh, from 24 and under. Uh, they also refer to them as transition-aged youth. Um, and it's not, to be honest with you, it's not an area that I have a lot of expertise in. Uh, we're, as we're standing up this new department, we have some folks working with us to come up with a strategy. I, I think the support, my, you know, I know a little bit about it, and my, my initial reactions are that this idea of permanent supportive housing for kids who are in transition, transition doesn't really make sense. It's like, let's give somebody in transition permanent housing. And, you know, most young people who are, you know, don't stay in the same place. They don't want to, you know, be locked into this permanent housing. And frankly, the idea of bringing like 100 uh, 17 to 21 year olds um, together in a place, you know, unsupervised, you know, it was hard enough for me when I was in a dorm um, <laughs> to keep it together. You know, kids who weren't taught the self-regulating behaviors, who come from really damaged backgrounds. I just think, so we need to come up with some new models, and I think to help young people self-resolve. These are kids who still, you know, have a chance to become economically self-sufficient. So I think we're looking at some um, interesting models of matching homeless youth with seniors, um, matching them with jobs, and looking at just different ways to, to provide housing options. Um, the range is really different. It's really different, and it actually is along class lines in San Francisco. Most African Americans um, uh, who are homeless won't identify themselves as homeless, and they will not access homeless services. Uh, they're couch surfing. Um, many of them are out uh, on Market Street engaged in um, you know, dealing weed um, and hanging out. Um, and are from the city and are absolutely not accessing services. We have to figure out how to, how to crack that code because they're going to end up being the next generation of, of homeless adults. Um, we also have a lot of kids who tend to primarily be um, Caucasians who are coming through, um, you know, kind of up and down the West Coast, escaping um, really uh, difficult situations at home. A high percentage of them are, are LGBTQ um, youth and trying to figure out what we can do to kind of get them back on the right track is, is going to be a big challenge. Um, but I don't have a whole lot of answers, but it's definitely something um, It's becoming a bigger and bigger crisis in the U.S., certainly in San Francisco. Um, and hopefully next time I come back, I'll have, I'll have better answers for you. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Igor and Jeff. Thanks.